and welcome to Dragons, Gazelles, and Unicorns podcast. I'm Rosemary Truman, founder and CEO of the Center for Advancing Innovation at Ignite Social Impact. And I'm here to welcome Chris Lee on the podcast. By the way, uh, very um, long time to be, l- long awaited time to have him on the podcast. And uh, he's one of my favorite people. He has an incredible and inspirational background. He's a financial genius and one of the people I admire the most for his vast knowledge and intellectual curiosity, as well as creative thinking. I'm very grateful and honored to have him on the podcast. So, um, Chris, thank you so much for your time today. No, th- thanks for having me. And with that glowing introduction, I wish I'd invited my, my, my wife and, and child to here, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's great to be here. All right. So, Chris... I mean, you were with the Milken Institute, you are the head of strategy at Palladium, you just did uh, enormous um, God's work to do some transactions there. Um, could, could you tell us about your background and your journey? Sure, no, ha- happy to. Um, and I'm, an, I'm an investor by training um, and, a, and a generalist in, in that respect. Uh, but I, I think my my journey, I guess, like like anyone, starts in the womb. Uh, I'm the son of a, a mathematician and a sociologist, and my, my brain, for folks that have worked with me, is a pretty even split between those two individuals. And you know, as a as a kid and an only child, we moved around quite a bit, and so I was exposed to a lot of different things very early on. And you know, I think the third or the fourth time you walk into the cafeteria not knowing anyone, you figure out that it's you who's gonna have to make things happen in life. And I think that experience drove you know, some curiosity, some resilience, uh, maybe a little bravery um, that I've translated into my, my career and my professional life. Um, so I, I started out as a, an investment banker um, and then I moved into to private equity um, in, in and around the, the financial crisis I had my own sort of personal psychic crisis about my potential contribution to the situation we were in and, and shifted gears um, to move to doing work in the federal government um, at the Agency for International Development. And you know my, my roles there were on international finance and economic development issues. Um, and over the next decade or so, got the opportunity to work on transactions in you know, 25 countries and six continents and, and multiple economic sectors and, you know, coming back, um, uh, you know, from that work, I wanted to draw some bigger, you know, kind of lines in, in the sand, so to speak, about what that means. And so then went to work in the nonprofit sector at a think tank called the Milken Institute, where you and I met. And, you know, my role at that time was doing financial markets research. Um, and, you know, since then, um, as you said, I've, I've moved on to, to Palladium and I lead strategy and mergers and acquisition for Palladium. And for people that don't know, Palladium is a you know, 3,000 person professional services co- company. So I, I don't know. I, I think it's a pretty diverse set of experiences, but the through line for me ultimately is investing in and attracting uh, capital to innovation and to emerging, emerging markets and underserved communities. So, um, so it's really interesting because, you know, I, I started my career at Goldman, so we kind of started in a similar spot. Um, but it's really inter- it's interesting to see how your career progresses a long time, along, along the trajectory. Um, I'm a, the daughter of a physicist, so I think we also started out similarly <laughs> there, there as well. Um, and I think, I think my mom definitely has a mathematician mind, um, but, I, but I'm actually kind of curious about the cafeteria story. Like you show up at the cafeteria and um, you have to have bravery because you're there and you don't know anyone, right? Yeah, and, and, and truly, okay. and so we, we, yeah, we, we moved around. And so going from Philadelphia to the mountains of Arizona, as a kid, you know, culture and what kids were interested in, um, what people spoke about, what was very, very different. And, 
you know, walking into those rooms, not having a brother or a sister or a parent or a friend to, to lean on, you, you very quickly kind of find your place and do what you can to, to adapt and, and find your place in the world. So, um, you know, I didn't really have a choice. Um, if I had the choice, I probably would have preferred not <laughs> to be thrust into those situations. But, you know, in, in hindsight, I, I do think it's been, you know, one of the main reasons that I've you know, been able to accomplish what I've, what I've accomplished, uh, uh, what I'm proud of. Yeah. So what is your secret sauce? My secret sauce, uh, as though you can sort of <laughs> bottle that and pour it on barbecue, right? Um, yeah. You know, I, I, well, I mean, I think the things that I'm proud of um, is, you know, again, kind of the ability to know how to rapidly adapt to new situations and to figure out how to bring the best of myself to each one of those situations. You know, I have sort of liked to coin the phrase, adaptability always wins, because I think the ability to you know, bring new people to your, to your story, the ability to contribute to theirs requires you know, adaptation uh, along the way. Um, I guess a couple other things that I'm proud of are being authentic um, and, and, and kind. Um, uh -huh. I, I'm going to tell you the, the truth in situations, but if it's a hard truth, you know, it's sort of my belief that messages and conversations can always be delivered in a way that's going to shape them in a positive way. Um, and, you know, the best way to be positive is to be kind and, and authentic. So I, I'm a big believer in, in that. Um, you know, and I guess the third thing that I'm proud of that I try to practice as much as I can is, is taking risks, um, but really focusing on the risks that are important to me, like at my core. And mm -hmm. I found when you do that, you create a bit of a low, no lose scenario because if the risk you took goes according to plan fantastic if it doesn't go according to plan you thought about it it was important to you and the journey itself you know allows you to grow and so i think focusing on risks that are really important to you and, and learning how to take them is, has been something that i really i really pride myself on and and actually you know to, to translate that to your world rosemary whenever i meet an entrepreneur you know i, I tell them that they've already won um, you know, they're going to figure out so much about themselves and their place in the world by trying to, to build something that, you know, that journey of self-discovery is almost more valuable than anything you can, you can buy in my, in my opinion. I agree. And I would say, uh, I would emphasize that, you know, I, I think that, you know, you are extremely creative, um, in many ways you're, I, I mentioned this at the beginning, you're a genius, but, um, and, but you're also extremely kind. And I think that goes a long way. And I agree with you on the risk part. You, um, you know, uh, um, I will say that Chris gave me a ticket to the Milken Institute, you know, event. And uh, that, that was kind of a risk. I mean, you know, <laughs> You don't know if I was going to like dance on the tables or something like that. You know, you know? <laughs> that, that has happened. You know, and, and when I was at, I did a project for Nokia um, for the board of directors. And the requirement was that everyone dances on the tables before you sign the document the next day. So, you know, <laughs> that was, that's a true, it's a true story. Um, well, well, there may have been some self-interest in that. <laughs> And, and, and seeing what you know, the Treasury Secretary's reaction was going to be to Rosemary in golf shoes and fishnets, which is what she ended up wearing um, to, to, to the conference. And you know, quite a few heads turned, and I I take credit for that as much as you can, Rosemary. So, well, I have to wear fishnet stockings because I've had so many freaking accidents, you know, <laughs> you know uh, airplane accidents, and everything else. I mean, you know, that that's why they made fishnet stockings. I have like. I don't know. I have to have a catalog system for them. <laughs> I just got a new pair. But, um, anyway, <laughs> moving on. Um, so I'm really excited about your new book. And it's, it, it, it's, it's a really would like to have some highlights of it. 
and I have a lot of questions about, about it. Um, could you just give an overview about your new book? We'd love to hear it. Yeah, sure. And, and this, I guess, is an example of that risk taking that I was talking about before, you know, putting yourself out there uh, on the creative side has been um, well received in my professional life, but very unexpected <laughs> from, from people, uh, which has been, you know, an outstanding, uh, you know, experience for me. Uh, so the, the novel is called Between the Shimmer and the Blinding, and uh, it's a multi-generational family drama, and it centers around a couple that's grappling with the decision of editing their embryos to reduce disease risks. And, you know, most books and creative content on genetic engineering that I've come across are dystopian or science fiction in nature, right? We're all living in space. And there's a master class who's now overlords over the, uh, the rest of us. But, you know, here on Earth, the science behind this has advanced dramatically. And we're actually nearing the on-ramp to that future society with hundreds of gene therapies and gene editing trials in the pipeline. And so we need to, as a society, make some decisions about what we're comfortable with in that regard you know if we're sitting at the on-ramp we've got to draw the map on when we want the the car to go in in the realm of genetic engineering and i think about the key questions uh in in the book and in this realm like a map you know, we've got sort of north south east and west on a, on a map mm -hmm. and for me the the north south question that we need to take on is on the one hand, are we willing to do germline engineering or just somatic editing? Germline engineering, meaning every subsequent generation will have those edits, have those in their bodies versus somatic editing, which is just the person receiving the treatment. And that's where it starts and, and stops. We need to figure out as a society, you know, whether we're comfortable with engineering, you know, the future when people aren't alive to consent uh, to those changes in their, in their bodies. I think the, the other key question that this book aims to, to get at is the kind of the east-west coordinates, which is on the one hand, therapy, meaning we can take on some debilitating genetic ailments you know, uh, through, through treatment, much like we do in other areas of, of medical research. And on the other side, we can have designer babies with this technology. We can select for uh, you know, eye color, hair color, height, and so where are we as a society, you know, on that continuum? Where do we want to go and mm -hmm. what do we want to allow for? And so, you know, this book helps to orient people in that map um, and explore those questions. Um, it does not do it on a scientific basis, and it does not do it on a technical basis. This is an emotional, uh, ethical story uh, of a family across the 20th and the 21st century. So that, that's sort of the, the backstop to the, to the novel. I love it. It's a, um, so what do you want? So I have a quick, another question. So what about the cures? So, I mean, you have therapies, you have uh, obviously diagnostics, but what about just curing before the person is alive, you know, I mean, basically, so maybe that's the designer baby idea. Yeah, I mean, it's, so that's part of the, the conundrum. And I think why this sort of therapy is so dramatic um, and, and actually how I came to it. Um, you know, I was at a symposium at MIT and, you know, there was some of you know, the brightest people on the planet. And we were talking about gene therapies and how they were gonna change our healthcare system, how they were gonna change the financial system. And ultimately these questions, I thought should not be decided by people in the ivory tower or people in the halls of Congress. Mm -hmm. These questions have multi-dimensional religious and ethical and moral and practical sides to them that I think need to be made by families around the dinner table, which is why I wanted to write something that, you know, got at that sort of, sort of question in a way that people could access it. Um, 
because not everyone is terribly interested in reading 26 letter uh, descriptions of the enzymes that were uh, that were experimented on through the through the process. So, um, so Chris, so I uh, we've we've looked at your the picture on uh, the cover of the of the book. Could you describe like what, how did you come up with that idea? So, even if you're not interested in this story or the issues, I think you could buy the book for its cover. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, agree. I, mean, I mean, it is it is an astonishing work. Of, of art, it, it truly is. Uh, the artist's uh, uh, name is Gregory Prestigort. He's a Philadelphia artist, and you can go online and, and see his his work. He, he shows in galleries all across the, the country. And you know, the image is an abstract black and white image of two individuals, and there's a light ahead of them that's refracting in multiple directions. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the, the symbolism of that is sort of the intensity um, of the crossroads that we're at. And that the main characters are facing in this book. Do they or do they not, you know, edit their their embryos, um, sort of a promise of the future and discarding the past sort of level of decision. Mm -hmm. And when I was describing the book to, to Gregory, you know, as only an artist can sort of have this long pregnant pause. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was describing you know, how the characters feel the weight of every generation before them when making this decision. And uh, he was looking down at his table, uh, the easel that has, uh, you know, been on top of that table for 10 years. Hmm. This table's caked with paint droppings, got coffee grounds all over it, sort of anything that could fall off an artist's hands that had been painting for 10 years. Huh. And he looked at that texture and he made the connection. You know, the buildup of all the experience and the history we have in our genes are really what's at stake with, with this sort of decision. And so... He saw the table in half and he painted the image on, on top of, you know, all that texture. Wow. So, so this painting, you know, if you see it in real life, some of it is two and three inches deep of, of texture and others are very smooth. I mean, it's, it's a very dramatic, very dramatic image. It's beautiful. And could you dive into a little bit more detail about the title of the book? Sure, sure. So it's between the shimmer and the blinding. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when you look at a shiny object, it's shimmering. The, the, the light is gonna catch your eye and you're entranced by that. There's a moment when that light hits at an angle and it blinds you and you've got to look away. We've all experienced this. And that to me is very symbolic of, you know, what we're facing with this decision about genome editing. If you think about the opportunity and you look at genome editing, it creates almost incalculable opportunity, right? It shimmers with you know, the brightest light of an eclipse, right? Mm. If we take the wrong angle with, with this, even if ever so slight, there could be catastrophic consequences mm. for, for society and we wind up blind. And so this book really is meant to immerse readers in that, you know, what I can think of as a very impossibly thin threshold, right, between... When something is really shimmering and beautiful and just before it could blind you is the is the inspiration beside that. Oh well, I have to tell a story because uh, Chris and I were at Starbucks. It was freezing, and um, we uh, we met to discuss what what is the you know how does how does the Center for Advancing Innovation work and things of that nature. And uh, I wonder if there's a shimmering and blindness there too, because I uh, I articulated the um, sausage making I would call it in uh, the how we select technologies that will go into new companies, and and Chris took copious notes. When I say copious, I mean like he wrote ev all of it down, <laughs> and I don't know it was a shininess. But and the blindness. I hope, I hope it was not both. But uh. <laughs> well, we're still here, right? That was uh, four, right. four plus years ago, and I probably still have those notes. Oh, you do. So, oh, I'm sure you do. The the personality flaw. You, you have a special <laughs> book. You have a special book that you put them in. So um, it was a black book, and it was a. Um, it was right. It was right before the Milken Institute, or yeah, yeah. It was right before the Milken Institute. Um, meeting. It was really fun. 
Yeah. Although I was thinking, I was just worried about you, um, you know, getting cold and that's, you know, going into your deepest, <laughs> um, uh, dying of coldness because it was so cold that that Starbucks. So um, <laughs> it was fun. And uh, I, you know, I appreciate that. It was, it was really good. So, um, so, so, you know, one thing that we, we chatted about when we were at that Starbucks is the, you know, the Center for Advancing Innovation where, you know, we work with about 150 institutes around the U.S. and about 170,000 inventions. And we are, we are like, we always try to figure out how do we commercialize the untapped potential of this on the shelf. Um, you have always had some great thinking on this. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, um, I guess pre presuming that the, the listeners know, you know, the details of the Center for Advancing Innovation, not having taken the copious notes that I, that I was able to at that, at that meeting. But I think what, what, what struck me is a, a number of different, very, very important topics that you all are, are taking on. Um, you know, one is government effectiveness. What you're trying to do in essence is ensure that the public research spending that we do as a country is reaching its natural endpoint. I mean, I think we all believe that not all research is, you know, commercially viable or has commercial applications even, but what you're doing is picking out those that do that have been overlooked and finding them a home. So I think you know, that's doing, you know, public service to this, to this country that, that's pretty important. Um, yeah, another thing that, you know, piqued, piqued my interest and, you know, hits close to home as the son of academics that we, we spoke about already is the help that you can provide the university systems across the country that are under tremendous financial pressure, um, which is almost a daily uh, you know, headline these days around the you know, rising tuition costs and, and the like. And so to the extent that you're partnering with university systems and commercializing, you know, more of their IP and they get a share of that revenue, I think you're getting at a pretty important problem in this country about supporting uh, higher education and, and universities. Um, you know, the third dimension of this that I was fascinated by, and I'm a big believer in, is how you bring together teams of people and how you bring together judges and just the swarm and the breadth of the swarm that you create around each of these innovations. And, you know, there's kind of a litany of studies out there showing, you know, the disproportionate demography in the startup community, right? Mm -hmm. And your model really is broadening participation in the startup process at all levels, which I think brings benefits, you know, that are direct and, and, and indirect um, to, to the communities that they're, they're birthed into. Um, and I, I think the last thing, and, and this probably should have been first, is that you know, the innovations that you all are focusing on are socially positive in nature and they're solving real problems you're not a doodad factory. No, <laughs> like, no, we're not. You know, like, like, like so many of the, of the, you know, other, you know, venture studio models and the accelerator models are out there. Um, you know, they don't have the focus on really intractable, important social issues that you all do. So, um, you know, suffice it to say, you know, why, you know, four plus years later, we're still uh, energized and talking is that I think it's a really important piece of, um, you know, architecture for the technology transfer um, in our in our country. Yeah. Well, we have to still we're still working on the architecture. Um, we actually uh, you you should put a, I don't know when your baby's coming exactly, but <laughs> if you're available on July fourth, you should come over because we're um, we're Greg Simons will be here and um, oh. you know you know him right. Yeah, we, uh, he was, he left Milken just as I was coming. So we were ships passing in the night, but obviously know of, of his work with Cancer Moonshot and, and, and the like. He's a tremendous person. Yeah, he's, he's, he lives two blocks from my house. 
he just he just walks over when I have a party. <laughs> it's really it's, a, it's really cool. Um, oh, that is cool. Well, that's that's the red zone. Um, <laughs> ba baby, babies do two weeks after that, and so we'll we, we'll see how that okay how that well, goes. I'd love to come if I can. Yeah, yeah. And then I'll, I'll make something um, that's well. We can talk about that later. But um, <laughs> I also I really appreciate you being on the advisory board for Ignite Social Impact, and um. And so I'm going, to, I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to scroll back to that. I want to go back to your book for a moment. So who do you want to read your book? I want basically anyone who's interested in, you know, their ancestry and their family and the future, uh, you know, their children's future to, to read this, because I, I truly believe that this question is one of the most profound questions that we face as a as a country, um, and I wrote it, you know, deliberately as a, a novel, deliberately as something that was accessible through, you know, language that didn't require a, a doctorate in, in, in biology to, to understand. And so, for me, this is this is designed to be beach reading. So anyone who brings a book to the beach, I'm hoping would, you know, would enjoy this and and you know, explore the issues that it it sort of got within it. Okay, which beach? Well, it's it's been read on multiple beaches. Uh, I'm told. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but you know, in uh, it's been read in Spain. It's been read in Australia. Uh, and it's okay. been read on the east and west coasts uh, of the U.S. Thus far, I, I, I've seen posts. Um, so I think Australia wins for the the best pictures that they've posted with the book. <laughs> All right, very good, very good. But we'll, we'll push it out to the beaches. Um, <laughs> For sure. So, um, it just, uh, you know, of, of course, you're, um, I'll go back to Ignite Social Impact and switch topics for a moment. Um, so, I'm very grateful for you being on the advisory board and um, where we are trying to democratize impact investing. And do you think there's a connection with the democratization of impact investing? And ignite social impact with your book, or what do you think? Philosophically speaking, I, I do because um, you know what I was trying to do with this is drive participation in a discussion around innovation. You know, uh, and this particular innovation, genetic engineering, is highly uh, consequential and, in many cases, controversial and. You know, my my point was to bring more voices to that and give them a stake in that issue. And and I think you at Ignite and you know broadly at, at Center for Advancing Innovation are trying to do the same thing. Uh, you're trying to bring more people, drive participation, give more access to people interested in building startups or or investing in them. You know, mm -hmm. I'm and I'm a big believer in that. Everything from voting rights to starting a new venture. I think the more people that are participating, the better the outcome is, is, is going to be. Um, and so I, I, I think you're on to something. Okay. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> All right. So, you, you know, of course, we focus a lot on entrepreneurship and uh, with both Ignite and also the Center for Advanced Innovation. What is your, you know, if you had like one big idea for the future of entrepreneurship, what would it be? Oh, nice, nice narrow question there. Really easy one. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I'm good at that. One <laughs> single idea about the future of, of entrepreneurship. Okay. So you, can, uh, you, can have, you can have three ideas if you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, one thing that sort of springs to mind, you know, for entrepreneurship as a space, mm. not necessarily a, a, a business idea, but mm -hmm. yeah, I think. We've had a lot of revolutions and a lot of democratizations. Um, we just spoke about one, right? Mm -hmm. Democratizing the financial markets and giving people access to, to funds. Um, we've also democratized access to markets, you know, with all the streaming services and the, you know, the e-commerce platform. We've also democratized the cost of inputs. It's very easy to and inexpensive to, to create and build something now. And so all of this democratization has basically built an ocean of everything 
because it's all been supply side and access driven. So you've got a notion of everything with very high failure rates associated with it. And so if you think about an example like the music industry mm. and, and Spotify, mm -hmm. where Spotify has 8 million artists mm -hmm. on, on their platform, mm -hmm. only 800 of those artists have received more than a million dollars in royalties. So if, if you're a music entrepreneur, if you're a creator, yeah. you're trying to make a success at that, your chance is, is pretty darn low. Yeah. And so to me, I think the next important idea for entrepreneurship is getting at that problem of failure rates and doing it from the demand side, not the supply side. Um, you know, creating an opportunity and some mechanism to signal and shape demand so that people are creating things that are used and are useful and get sold and get bought mm -hmm. um, so that we're not wasting time and talent and resources on, on things that ultimately just uh, never see the light of, never see the light of day. Um, so maybe I just pitched CAI again, but <laughs> I, mean, I, I do sort of believe that sort of the demand side um, of entrepreneurship is, is really the nut to crack at, at this point because it's so easy to create the supply hmm. at this point. You know, so I have to tell you something. I, I mean, uh, you, you know, I started my career at Goldman and I was told 145 times no. And I was... Um, what, was the, what was the question or what were you asking for? <laughs> I was asking for a job. I was oh, asking okay. for a job. I wanted to be on the list of stock block desk and they didn't have any analysts there. And I had already, I had already, gosh, contacted every single alumni that you can possibly imagine in the Princeton Smith, you know, network. And, um, and they said, well, we don't hire people with non MBAs. So then I wrote a proposal. I mean, I, gathered as much data as possible. And I wrote a proposal to say, I'll save you $40 million if you pay me $400,000. And um, the 146th time they said yes. Uh, but it was a pretty funny story because of course they, then they dropped to zero. <laughs> so it's like 40,000, but I saved them 60 million in the first six months because I made up this straight through processing technology platform idea but um, that's, that's the only point to that is that, you know, you can create your own opportunities and shape demand. The, the, the thing that, one of the things I would put a, a pillar on, if you will, or a point on, is that the shaping demand component is um, something you can control. And, you know, for example, you can, you can create your own meetings. You don't have to go to a conference. You can create your own conference, you know? Uh, it's about creating your own path and creating your own opportunity. And I, that's what you said also. And um, one thing that I'd love you to, to um, provide a bit more detail on is the access to markets component. You have a yeah. You, you have deep thinking on this, on these, and on these items. But the, that one, I I think that the people who are listening would really benefit from. You have I mean, the access to markets. You you sure. have an example of streaming services, but you know, you could put a pinpoint on that. Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of different issues around access to markets um, on, on both sides of. Of, of the equation, right? And, you know, I, I think for me as an investor, the most important challenge about broadening access to markets, meaning giving more people the opportunity to participate in them mm. is, you know, providing visibility about the markets themselves. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not participating in the market, it's having access to educational tools and sheer knowledge that the market exists and mm. training about how to participate. Mm -hmm. in it. Um, the second big component about markets, at least from a financial point of view, is, is data. Yeah. As those markets seek to serve more people, 
the number one reason why they can't or they don't is because there is not data to prove that those new markets in fact need to be served. Mm. And I see this time and time again in the United States mm -hmm. um, where access to credit and access to investment capital doesn't go to certain zip codes because mm -hmm. the data isn't, isn't there or does not fit into the same boxes uh, that people are used to seeing. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, uh, like on the continent of Africa, where I've done you know, work in, in 10, 10 different countries, some of the biggest challenges that the data doesn't exist. And so you've got this, this sort of vicious circle where people don't invest because the data doesn't exist, which means society keeps getting more challenging to predict. The data keeps getting harder to, to collect and they get further and further outside of the, of the investability box that people are trying to, to fit into. And so for me, markets and access to markets is about giving people the visibility to participate and the tools to participate and then giving the market itself mm. you know, better data points to grow it, its relevance in, into new, new areas. Hmm. Hmm. So one of the things that I, I really like about you is that you have um, this desire to pull people together into, with, with different dynamics it's one of the things, it's, it's a special talent of yours. And I, I wonder, you know, what, what is the um, backdrop to that? You know, you, you are inspired to pull, galvanize, I'll, I'll say galvanize, people together that are different. So like John Parker and us, remember we had that lovely um, meeting together like a million years ago, it feels like. Um, and, uh, and so you have, you know, you, do, you have a desire to, to basically galvanize these different multidisciplinary people. And I think that you've already mentioned it before, but are there any other thoughts that you have about how you lean into the different dynamics you pull together? Well, I mean, we, we joked about the Milken. <laughs> I know. Right. But I, but I think that's a, a dynamic where I saw an opportunity to have interesting and unexpected conversations. And, you know, I think that real progress and real learning and real change can occur when people are able to see new perspectives firsthand and they're able to experience it firsthand. And so bringing people together is is a way to do that. Um, and I think from a, from a business um, point of view or you know, creative point of view or whatever you know, entry point you're, you're operating from, I, I think by bringing different people together, you're immediately gonna expand your relevance mm -hmm. and you're gonna expand the adoption of whatever it is you're trying to do. That's perfect, I love that. Um, and when you do that, you are gonna reduce the risk that your project doesn't reach critical mass. So yeah. there's a lot of kumbaya um, in, in the world about coming together as people, but I think it serves a, a particular function in, in, in driving, driving things forward. You know, if you kind of reflect on, I mean, you have done, so, uh, in my opinion, God's work on financial engineering and, uh, you know, your, as I mentioned before, you're creative kind, you're uh, a genius, a financial genius, um, risk-taking, you have uh, lots of high, lots of qualities. I, you know, if you kind of reflect it back on what you've done, what would you say were your, you know, top successes and, you know, what would you, what would you say you had learned as well? Um, so I, I don't like to think of the world in, in, in two columns, like wins or losses, right? I think a lot, a lot of people focus on, tell me your singular success or tell me a time that you really, you know, fell on your face. And yeah, I, I think this is maybe a naive viewpoint, but mm. 
you know, to me, a short-term loss can actually create a long-term gain. And, I agree, I agree. And, you know, an experience from, from my life was in and around the financial crisis that I you know, spoke about briefly earlier. You know, I was doing uh, leveraged buyouts here in Washington, mm, D.C., okay. and, uh, you know, the credit markets, you know, totally dried up. And if there's no leverage, you're not doing any leveraged buyouts. And, I was told by you know, the two partners that I worked for, you know, that I could move to you know, Knoxville, Tennessee and, and take up a post leading one of the companies that we owned, or I could accept their letters of recommendation and, and find something new to do uh -huh. with my life. And I was taking the woman that now is my wife, who was in a PhD program here in Washington. And so moving wasn't, wasn't a choice. So I called a friend of mine who was uh, over in Ethiopia at the time doing uh -huh. charity work. And well, I emailed him. I didn't call him. That would be an expensive phone call. So I emailed my friend. Um, and he, he said, come over. We'll put you to work. Um, and you know, maybe it'll help clear your head and decide what you, you want to do. And so I went to Ethiopia. And we were hitchhiking across the country um, on, on a weekend there. And we were at a jazz club one, one night. And, and so Ty, I'll, I'll you know, invoke the spirit of your father uh, uh, in, in a small jazz club. And in Ethiopia and struck up a, a conversation with a couple of people that were there with the World Bank and there with USAID. And he said, what are, you, what are you doing here? And they said, well, we're working with all the banks to try and get access to financing for small businesses in this country. And I remember just oh, wow, sitting, cool. sitting back and saying, that sounds like incredibly meaningful work. It, it sounds like I could really contribute to that. And so I, you know, flew back to the U.S. and got my letters of recommendation from the buyout firm and handed them to USAID and, and then changed, changed paths and, and went to government for um, the better part, quite a part of a decade. And so in that moment, when they delivered the news to me that I you know, had a pretty short runway, I, I, you know, panicked, but then that turned out to be one of the, the watershed moments of my trajectory. So it, it's always hard to, to do wins and losses for, for me over the years. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, I would just say that uh, Goldman, you know, I was the first analyst hired at 19 there. And a lot of the stock block desk where we had to, we traded two to $3 billion a day. Mm. And, um, and then they had to haze me. And so, <laughs> so that the hazing was, uh, um, I don't know. Well, you, you haven't, uh, actually, you know what? Next time I see you, I have to give, give you some peppers. Because then the thing is, I think that if I ever decide to change businesses, that I'll, I'll be able to make peppers for a living. <laughs> they hate me with peppers. And I thought my stomach was going to fall out in the first six months when I was there. And, um, and then I became the expert in all kinds of peppers. I mean, I know I have every single, single kind of pepper. I can make any kind of pepper sauce on the planet. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, they, these are sometimes there's little tiny things that, um, yours is bigger, but that, that's a little tiny thing that um, became. Well, when you're the, you know, the pepper queen of, of North America, we'll know, we'll know why, right? Yeah, you'll know why. <laughs> I actually have analyzed every taste put in your mouth to, to figure out how do you tantalize all of them at the same time. And, uh, and I make up another pepper routine every week. So, um, yeah, and I make my own peppers too. So I'm not, I'm not like just buying, you know, buying stuff. It's, you know. Yeah, well, inflation's up. So it may be cheaper to, <laughs> to buy them now. <laughs> so, you know, you're, you're really an entrepreneur in your own right. All the things you've done to make trailblazing, uh, you know, trailblazing lots of paths um, and, um, in, in many different ways, uh, in particular, what you've done uh, recently, you know, so what advice would you give to an entrepreneur who is, you know, in these new kind of dynamics that we have going on? Um, cause the, obviously things have changed. Sure. Um, yeah, well, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial people 
um, you know, in government and in the nonprofit sector and entrepreneurs themselves. And people that are trying to do new things face pretty daunting challenges. Um, and I guess one piece of advice that I would give is that as quickly as you can, discard the notion of being a hero. I think people celebrate entrepreneurs. You know, the archetype is the, the lone dynamic visionary leader that protects their time and their cap table and their IP and everything from everyone. And they've done it themselves. And, I, and, and not to discount the importance of, of you know, bootstrapping and, and being smart with your assets, but to me, the people that break through do the opposite. Um, they're selfless, not selfish, because what they can do is explain to new potential teammates what this company is bringing to them. You know, why is it going to help their career by joining a, a high-risk venture? You know, they can show their customers what's in it for their life, not this cool thing that I you know, manufactured. They can show their funders why this investment makes sense for their portfolio. So it's, it's all about getting others on board with what you're you are doing. And so then the quicker that someone who is on that journey or contemplating that journey can flip the switch and not think like the, the lone visionary hero, the, the better the chances they'll have of, of making it. Chris. Can you hear me? That is really amazing. I mean, I wanted to say uh, selfless, not selfish. And it's all about getting others on board, you know, because we're, which it's, it's, a, it's, it's very interesting because, you know, that everybody told me I was crazy when I started the Center for Advanced Innovation because, you know, you, you, know, you have to raise money, right? And um, uh, you, you have to be able to get, to be able to see how you get others on board and um, you don't get others on board if you're not humble, not kind, you know, you get them on board because you're humble and you're kind and um, selfless. And, and you, uh, of course, are the the humble, you are so humble and uh, smart, multidisciplinary, genius. Um, you are the selfless, not, you are the selfless. Well, I mean, I think, that, well, what interested you know, me again about CAI was you know, the fact that you were trying to basically shrink wrap all of these really, really challenging issues that people face in bringing people to their table, right? Um, finding the right teammates, um, finding the right product, finding the right funders. I mean, th these are all really challenging things in their own right. And um, I think you've given people, uh, you know, sort of a perimeter to operate within that, you know, helps to control for that and teaches the, the ability to bring people to, to their table. So I think you're you know, doing people a service in, in, in what you're trying to accomplish as well. It's a putting rabbits out of the hat. <laughs> I, 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 have, I have to do that a, a few times a day, you know, <laughs> but, but uh, that's the purpose. You know, the, the idea is that, you know, we have, you know, we spend as taxpayers 140 to $160 billion a year. And we have about 1.5 to $3.5 trillion of IP sitting on the shelf and only 0.01% of it goes out. And then, you know, imagine this, you know, the, the invention sitting on the shelf, collecting dust in a dark room with a, you know, with a locked door, you know, and then they could make really, truly an impact on the world. And then, you know, hooking them up with the best entrepreneurs and mentors and, and, you know, the, you know, our, our nickname is the Tinder for startups. So we have to uh, kind of connect the pieces together for the team. So, but I, I'm very grateful for your uh, recognition of that. Um, all right. 
final thoughts on uh, your new book and your, are you going to do another one? Future, future books? What do you think? I, I think I will. I mean, the, the process itself was incredibly rewarding. Um, you know, much like, you know, I, I, I spoke about entrepreneurs and the self-discovery process being the reward in and of itself. I think writing this book was very similar to that um, experience. And, you know, of course, I think that this is a, a very important topic that will all be affected by one way or the other. And so my hope is that, you know, this book gives people a new opportunity to, to enter the discussion. And so even if they don't do that, I would encourage people to get you know, uh, you know, educated and involved in the debate that's going on with these, with these technologies. And I'm very grateful. And I know that the listeners are very grateful to learn about all your wisdom and my goodness gracious, we're going to have some fantastic points about your, your book and, every, and yourself and everything else. And um, I want to just reiterate that, you know, you're one of the most humble multidisciplinary, creative, genius, selfless, not selfish um, people that I've ever met. So I just wanted to mention that um, extremely grateful. I could go on and on, but uh, I think I'll stop there. 